All right, guys, so we're going to start. So this is our last lecture of uh, the early church and the Roman life. I know it's been quite a quite a heavy uh, lecture, um, but hopefully um, you've uh, enjoyed it. Hopefully you got some interesting facts and ideas, and you better understand um, Paul. Um, so we're going to carry on tonight. I'm going to look at um, the traveling of Paul and just traveling uh, at large. Um, if we have a look, if we have to travel ourselves long distance today, we generally jump into a, a car, into an airplane. Well, in the ancient world, if you had to travel any length of distance, you can generally do that by either walking foot or um, by boat. So land and sea travel are very common aspects of the Roman society 2,000 years ago. And in this final lecture, we're going to walk us, I'm going to walk us through what it was like to travel by way of foot as well as by way of boat, and what this looked like for the Apostle Paul, who spent considerable time on both foot and boat. And then this lecture. Uh, and series concludes with what I believe is one of the most powerful things the Apostle Paul ever said about what it means to follow Jesus. So um, this is really what we're going to be looking at uh, tonight. Um, again, if we get um, if the session one finishes, just remember to give ten minutes before session two starts. Right, so we know that Paul was one of one who traveled in a, a lot in his journey, and if you if if you ever studied Paul at varsity or or just have a, a Bible study at, uh, about Paul, it's good to know that he has three missionary journey. There is a fourth one, but the fourth one is not very well known and very well documented. But the three traveling journeys, missionary journeys, as they were called. Um, are well documented. And so when it came to travel in the ancient world, one of the things that we, we need to just understand is that most people did this either by land or by sea, as I said. This was very common in Paul's day, and the main reason for this is because Rome was ruling the world. Uh, Rome had all, all, roads, uh, all roads lead to Rome, um, as Rome, the Romans were known to build roads. Um, they had the, what it was called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. Things are relatively at peace, and so people have the freedom to travel. So I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about land travel as well as sea travel, just to give you a window into what the world was like, especially for the Apostle Paul, who's engaged in both of yes, these travels. So first of all, most people traveled by foot or on foot. Most people didn't have a horse that they traveled with. If you were very well yes. to do, you would do that. Most people traveled on foot. Mary and Mark, I think your microphone is on. Mary and Mark? I think no, your microphone is on. Our mic is muted. I think the next phone is... Is not muted. Okay. Uh, Net. Apologies, you... I didn't know it was even working. <laughs> okay, wait. I can I can mute you from here. There you go. go there you go. All right. So if you had a horse, uh, sorry, an average day walk was about 30 kilometers if you were on a journey. If you had a horse, you could go about 48 kilometers, but most people were on foot and you went about 30 kilometers a day um, if you were traveling from one place to another. Now, you're also carrying your stuff as you go. And if you are traveling and you're a well-to-do kind of person, then you have slaves to carry that. But if not, you're carrying your stuff a long, long way. It was dangerous to travel because of the widespread problems of robbers and pirates and all that kind of stuff. Now, we get this in the parable of the Good Samaritan story that there were robbers that were in the land of Israel. This is true all around the Roman Empire. It's not just the land of Israel. Robert um, Gala, uh, Garland 
um, says this about venturing out in, in, in that time. He said, as a traveler in the countryside, you would have taken your life in your hand as you would do if you had venture abroad at night in a big city. As a result, the well-to-do rarely venture out of doors unaccompanied. Okay. So now one of the things that you would find on Roman tombstones is this Latin phrase, interfectus a latronibius, which means killed by robbers. Okay. So it was something that was prevalent and a problem in the ancient world, Roman world. Then you have also got the empire that was connected by these paved roads. The estimated, estimated is somehow between 88,000 kilometers of paved roads that from Rome to the different places of the empire, of Roman empire. And that's why they said that all roads lead to Rome. Now, this is, uh, now this made travel easier. It didn't make travel, uh, it made travel easier, but it didn't make travel easy. But then you are on the main road. I mean, these things were incredibly well built. You can walk for kilometers of these 2,000 years old roads, even today. And if you've ever been to Israel, if you've ever been into any of those European countries where the Roman Empire was uh, once uh, ruled, there will be these uh, roads and um, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So that's just a snapshot into the land travel side of things. Now let's talk about sea travel. When it comes to the Mediterranean Sea, the Romans did not call it the Mediterranean, they called it Mara Nostrum, which means our sea, very prideful, prideful in their approach to the we own the sucker, we own the sea, we're going to, uh, this is our, our water, this is our highways, we're going to control who comes, goes, and who spends time in it. And so you've got all of these travels going through the Mediterranean. Now, when it comes to sea travel, like land travel, it was also dangerous. And it was dangerous due to both weather and piracy. So when it comes to weather, there was a, a six-month six months window in which you could travel without huge concern about the weather going sideways on you. And, and, and that was typical from late March to late September. That was okay. Now, from marine archaeology, we find that the most amount of sheep, shipwrecks actually occurred in the ancient world between 100 BC and 300 AD than any other pe period. And you can see these are um, marine archaeologists um, finding some artifacts um, in the Mediterranean Sea. It helps us to see that people were traveling a lot at the height of the Roman Empire. And then you have that in about 67 BC, and it uh, relates to piracy. Pompey the Great was the first one to not put a total ban on piracy, but to put it in check. It had been a massive problem before Pompeii, and Pompeii did something, may as some, he did some amazing work in order to curb the piracy that was happening on the Mediterranean Sea. Nicholas Parcel, who wrote a fascinating book on the Mediterranean Sea, said that the Mediterranean seaways offered a world of opportunity and danger in which the galaxy was tenuous and violence was normal. Um, well, that was sea life. Now, when it comes to travel on the sea, if you were a private individual, you were traveling as a passenger or traveling on a passenger ship, a ship or on a merchant ship. And so if you were on a passenger ship, you had an idea of where it was going. If you weren't going to be traveling on a passenger ship, you would be hanging around a harbor, talking to merchants, trying to figure out, are you going where I need to go? And if so, you can jump aboard, obviously, for a certain fee. And so you are bringing food with you, stuff to cook with. You bring your own bedding. 
You're carrying everything. None of this was provided for you. You carried it with you. And then you try to figure out, okay, can I get on a passenger ship? If not, is a mission ship going to where I need to go? Now, here's an artist rendering of the Roman naval ship. So these things are big, extremely well built. Uh, but all of the ships were incredibly well built, not just the, uh, the naval ships, but all the ships, passenger and merchant. And this is a model of, uh, um, sorry, this is a model of a merchant ship. And this is one of the, what you can actually see at Ephesus today. So this is an artist rendering, but you can see one similar to that uh, even today. If you go to the region where Ephesus is, is which is in modern-day Turkey. Now, we see that in Paul's journey to Rome, he experienced a shipwreck, and they fell, they fell, ashore, they fell ashore on the island of Malta. They wintered there, and now they are trying to figure out how do we get to Rome when a ship is at the bottom of the Mediterranean. And so in Acts chapter 28, we are told that after three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship which had wintered at the island and which had the twin brothers, a reference to Pastor and Pollux, uh, and it carries on for it, its uh, figurehead. So this is how Paul and his crew eventually got to Rome, where Paul was awaiting his first trial under the Emperor Nero. So that's just a little snapshot into the watery ways and the sea travel. What I want to do now is I really want now to shift gears entirely to Paul. And I want to just kind of talk about this last part of this lecture in this way. I want to look at and honoring the, the distance in which he traveled. Because something happens in scripture quite frequently. And I would just summarize it. In this way, the Bible uses an economy of words. In other words, it doesn't necessarily have too much words to describe something. It says something and, and you go, okay, is that far? Uh, it sounds far. I'm not sure if it is far because all of a sudden it says, well, and they went here and they went here and they went over here. And if you don't understand the geography, you don't have a great atlas in front of you you miss the significance behind the economy of the words. And often you find it both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So, for example, this is the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. And it is in Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And you can see the picture underneath. Um, it says, and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the island country and came to Ephesus. Or your text may say that Paul took the road through the interior and came to Ephesus. Now, on a map here that you see in blue is what Acts 19 verse 1 just said. 900 plus kilometers of trekking through rough terrain for Paul to end up at Ephesus. And we have in in just this verse, yeah, Paul passed through the inland country uh, uh, and came to Ephesus. It's a long distance. And this is true throughout Paul's missionary journeys. Okay, so it's not literally um, just around the corner at the corner coffee shop or the corner um, supermarket or, or something like that. It was a long distance. So I want to talk about Paul's first journey and second journey. And you can see on the one side, first missionary journey. On the other side, side of the map of his second missionary journey. Um, and as we, we already looked at the third journey. And then he, his journey to Rome. And I just want to put up these maps here just to highlight. And so first missionary journey and second missionary journey which then left Asia and then went into Europe. Third missionary journey, um, as we saw earlier, and Paul's trip to Rome. And you can see by these red marks um, all over the place that um, those were long distances that Paul covered. This is one of the beautiful 
port cities that Paul sailed out of in his first missionary journey of uh, Italia, beautiful, beautiful area. If any of you ever been to the Mediterranean or you've actually hiked in the Middle East, whether you've been on Roman roads, you know that hiking outside of Roman roads is ragged. You go up on these high hills, you look down on these valleys, you climb through these rocks, and this is the kind of terrain that Paul is both sailing on and walking through. So obviously, this is a, 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 re a reasonably recent uh, uh, picture of that port, the artist rendering of what the port would have looked like um, in the time of, of, of Paul. And so... What I've done is I've laid out here how far this dude, Paul, actually sailed and walked on his journeys. And I run it up to about 30 kilometers either direction, up or down. Of course, he's walking in and out of villages and cities every day when he's in these places. Remember, the average walk in those days would be 30 kilometers a day. So you can imagine how long it took him to get to, to a place. Uh, but this is just from point to point. How far did he sail? How far did he walk? Well, in his first missionary journey, a thousand kilometers of sailing and plus minus 1,200 kilometers of, I'm going to call it hiking because it's not casual walking through the park. The dude, this guy, Paul, was actually hiking. First missionary journey, 2,200 kilometers. Together, total, okay. Second missionary journey, he sailed 2,200 kilometers and hiked about 2,300. Um, so that gives you about 4,500. And third missionary journey, 2,500 kilometers of sailing and 2,700 kilometers of hiking. By the way, isn't it interesting how close the sailing and the walking are for all these journeys? Now, add on to this his journey to Rome, which is mainly sailing. It's another 3,500 kilometers. And Apostle Paul, in these first three journeys, you can work it out for yourself. He's sailing and uh, hiking a lot. And this doesn't even take into consideration, as I said, the fourth missionary journey after being released under Nero and where he went from the which his later letters give us indication of where he visited. We just don't have the itinerary and we don't have enough documentation to really plot his fourth missionary journey. And add that, add that on top of that, and that's how many kilometers the guy actually went. So long, long distances. And what did he actually do? He planted churches. He went into the cities, into these towns, into these villages, and he planted churches uh, wherever he went. That's what this man did. Now, many of us know the famous passage in 2 Corinthians 11. And before we read this, now in light of some of this additional information I've just given you, okay, um, all right, we've got about 10 minutes of, uh, this session, so as I say, I always say, if you get kicked out, please just uh, log on 10 minutes afterwards. So before we read this, in light of everything that I've said and all the information that I've given you so far in the lecture, let's be reminded when the Apostle Paul wrote Second Corinthians, he is in the midst of his third missionary journey. He's writing from Ephesus. He hasn't yet gone and sailed and hiked back to Europe at the end of his third missionary journey. He has not been arrested in Jerusalem yet. He has not spent two years under prison and arrest in Caesarea on the coast. He has not appealed to Caesar yet. He has not made his trip to Rome in which he had another shipwreck. And this doesn't include after his first trial under Nero getting out and going on a fourth missionary journey, and then getting arrested again. Okay, so this is just a background. None, none of this is part of his resume yet. And all of the trouble he went through. So just know that this is all happening sometime before and during 
his third missionary journey. So here we go. This is what he says. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? Now, he actually says, I'm out of my mind talking like this. And don't you just laugh, Paul, because he keeps on and he says, I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I've received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I, I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in dangers from my fellow Jews, in dangers from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked, and beside everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. I mean, don't you just love the way he just describes it? And the question is, why? Why does Paul do this? Well, he gives us some indication in his first missionary journey, he sails from Seleucia to the island of Patmos. He goes up then into Asia Minor area. He goes to Perga, to Antioch, to Iconium, to Lystra. He's in Lystra, and then the man gets stoned, and it says that they all believed he was dead, and so they dragged him out of the city and flopped him down as a dead man, and yet he wasn't dead. He comes back from being unconscious, completely beaten to shreds with rocks spouted at him, blood, bruises, swelling everywhere, and he walks right back into the city. Sort of like, hey, everyone, it didn't work. Sorry for you. And then it says the next day they go to Derby, which is the next city on the road, Roman road. And it is here where Paul says this, or, or rather Luke records for us. It says, they preached the gospel in that city, talking about Derby, and then won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, to right where he had been stoned. And what's more, he goes to um, Iconium and Antioch. It was the people who were angry with Paul and Ant at Antioch and Iconium that tracked him down into Lystra in order to stone him. He goes right back to where everybody wants to kill him and you go, Paul, why are you doing this? He's doing this to strengthen the disciples and to encourage them to remain true to the faith. And then you go, well, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, here's something Paul understood. Following Jesus isn't safe, and it was never intended to be so. And in Paul's last letter, he writes to Timothy, anybody who, 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 anybody knows where Timothy is from? Well, he's from Lystra. Guess who watches Paul get stoned nearly to death on his first missionary journey? It's Timothy. Who got picked up to be Paul's disciple on Paul's second missionary journey? Timothy. Who is Paul's constantly pouring into? Again, Timothy. All right, guys, we're going to get kicked out just now. So uh, I'm going to ask you to log off, and um, we will meet uh, in about 10 or so minutes uh, as we do session two. All right, I'll see you just now. Hi. Hi Welcome back. 
Let's just wait for the others to log on. I think that uh, Jeno is not here. Guys, uh, while we wait to see if there's anyone who's going to log in, are there any questions so far um, with regards to just lectures up to now or tonight's uh, session one? No, they've all been very interesting, Lukai. It's interesting Thanks. also to note that uh, uh, Paul sailed virtually as far as he walked yeah, on each yeah. of his missionary journeys. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, all right, guys. Yeah, I think I'm thinking yeah. 30 kilometers is from here to Udenaig. Mm. Yeah, that's, that, that's, yeah, so that will be per day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do we have it? Why do we have any idea of the total kilometers he traveled? The what? The total number, the total kilometers he traveled. The total kilometers. The total kilometers. I think I mentioned it. Uh, let me just oh, go. Back. Oh. Yeah, I think I mentioned. Let me go back. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't mention it, but I would say maybe <laughs> close to ten thousand kilometers. Mm -hmm. Ten thousand. Wow. Yeah. All in total, if we had to add in, including the fourth uh, fourth uh, missionary journey, uh, I would say it, it was around then. All right, guys, let's carry on. So, so we're now looking at uh, Timothy, who becomes then his um, his successor, if we will. Um, that that um, he actually saw um, uh, uh, Paul being. Uh, stoned um uh, and he he um uh, went with him uh on the journeys and certainly first and second uh the book of first and second T timothy tells you a lot of detail about that so um so we carry on and he says and when paul is in rome about to die knowing that his race has come to the end he writes here in second timothy chapter three you are ever speaking to Timothy, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecution, my suffering, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, in Iconium, and in Lystra, the persecution that I endure, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Okay? What an encouraging thing. And, and, and as I said, he, he, he talks to Timothy, who's seen that. He's experienced it. He was an eyewitness to that. And um, and here Paul is saying, just before he dies, he's saying, well, my race is finished. And he's encouraging, um, you know, um, Timothy to just carry on walking that distance, carry on sailing, carry on spreading the word of God. Sort of reminiscent of Joshua chapter 1, where where God reminds Joshua, just like I was with Moses, so would I would be with you. And in a way, Paul is saying to 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 Timothy, just as the Lord rescued me, He's going to rescue you as well. The Lord rescued me from all of them. He says, "Wait a minute, has he? Is uh, uh, he, he has been stoned? He has been shipwrecked? He has been robbed?" He's been beaten time and time again, and Paul has the audacity to go, yeah, 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 God rescue me from all of them. Well, if that's God's form of rescue, I'm not sure how many of us want to sign up for that kind of rescue. Because, I mean, yeah, if this is what it means, um, I don't know we would ha that we would have many followers. Um, you know, certainly the road to the cross is not without... Um, without any ups and downs. But here's what Paul was getting at. And he says, in a way, paraphrasing, yeah, God got me through. Why does Paul do this? Why does he Why does he get through all of these turmoils? And, and, and he knows, um, one will imagine that after the first missionary journey, he would stop, but he doesn't. Because he knows that doing the work of Jesus is dangerous. I'm in danger in the countryside. 
I'm in danger in the city, says. I'm in danger with the robbers. It's like everywhere Paul goes, there's danger. But I actually think that the reason why the danger arises is because Paul himself is dangerous to the dark forces of the world. Paul himself knew and understood what it means to wear the armor of God. Not only did he write that when he saw the soldiers standing outside of, but he knew what he what he was talking about when he talks about the spiritual warfare and that we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against spiritualities, okay? And that Paul understood the following Jesus isn't necessarily safe. Now, how many of us have heard the the safest place to be is in the center of God's will? If that's the case, Paul set a really bad example. And you know who else did, it, did, it, did that? Is Jesus. Because where did the center of God's will take Jesus? To the cross. And when Jesus tells his disciple that Caesarea Philippi, for the very first time, he says, I'm going to die. He says, pick up your cross and follow me, me my cause, uh, because it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's not a cakewalk. It's not something easy and nice and, and sweet and, and fluffy and, and creamy. And one of the things that I have been challenged with with in my own life is that when live that we're living today, we often make decisions first and foremost based on safety, don't we? Now, am I going to be safe? Is my family going to be safe? Is my friends going to are my friends going to be safe? And so on. Those are the questions that we ask ourselves as 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 a person. That when God calls us into something, the first thing we go we are asking is. Is this safe? Am I going to be successful? What's the itinerary here? What do you mean I don't get to decide the destination? Because you don't. Following Jesus, you don't know the destination, do you? Yes, you're eventually going to land up in heaven. But what's going to happen along along the way? Okay. Uh, in, in one of the many funerals that I've done, there's a, there's a beautiful poem called The Dash. And it talks about the dash between the day you're born to the day you die. And and the, and the author of that poem says, well, what have you done with your dash? Okay. And it's like all of a sudden we make decisions of God saying, I want you to be faithful. And yet we allow the fear of the unknown of what's going to happen. How is this going to turn out? What would my extended family say about this? Will I be successful? Will it be comfortable? And so often we make decisions on fear rather than on faith on, on, on faithfulness. And it's not that fear is wrong. Don't get me wrong here. I actually think fear is a good thing because fear lets you know that you are doing something significant. It 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 allows you to hone in. On, on the weight of that moment. But where fear becomes problematic is when it leads to paralysis. Courage is pushing through the fear, not experiencing the fear. And I think over and over and over again, Paul experiences fear, but he did not let fear keep him from faithfulness. And the reason why we have gathered to talk about how Paul uses a man like the Apostle Paul is because he knew, he knew that following Jesus wasn't safe. That was never supposed to be in the, in the cards for, for Paul. We are called to be faithful whatever the cost. That was the Apostle Paul. And the question is, could the same be said of us as well? All right, guys, so this is basically the end of our lectures uh, for this year. Um, last last week, uh, someone was asking me, I mentioned Revelation and I did a, 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 a teaching on Revelation. So um, I thought about it and I don't have a problem with doing it again. Um, so next year, we're going to start in February um, and we're going to look at the book of Revelation. It will be our first series, Introduction to the Old Testament. Will be a second series, and the introduction to the New Testament will be a third series. 
that we're going to be looking at next year. So um, just a, a word on the book of Revelation. And if you are interested in a book of Revelation after the lecture, just give me thumbs up so I know that we have enough for me to do that. It's a lot of work. Um, even though I've done the lectures before. Um, just a word on that. Uh, we're going to be putting it into context, the book of Revelation. I'm not necessarily going to talk a lot about the end time, and I'm not going to talk a lot about the the, the different uh, numbers and, and, and um, you know, 666 and all of that. We are going to touch it, but I'm going to be putting it into context. I'm not going to be putting it into all the discussion that uh, you know we are in the end times and and uh, and 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 all that kind of stuff. We will talk about the tribulation. We will cover all of that. But if you're wanting to put, do the book of Revelation because you want me to tell you when Jesus is coming back, then that's not going to happen. Okay, we will look at it from a point of view of putting it into context and actually again seeing where John, who writes this amazing book. And obviously understanding the apocalyptic literature that he uses. Then the introduction to the Old Testament will actually literally do a scheme through the entire Old Testament. Um, and we're going to be looking at the different books, the structure of the Old Testament, and and um, the way it is put together. And we're going to literally scheme through it. And then we're going to do the same thing with the New Testament. So hopefully I will see you next year. For those that I'm not going to see uh, during Christmas, have a blessed Christmas and a happy 2025. And for those who I'm going to see on Sunday or during the week, uh, have a good week. And uh, hope I will see a lot of you, uh, if not all of you, and even more. Please share these lectures with others. It will be, to, it will be nice to see other faces as well. Okay, guys, so God bless, and thank you for um, allowing me to uh, be your teacher. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Lechai. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. That was very okay. interesting. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless. God bless. You as well.